Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, for our next installment of The Educated Eye, Understanding the Hermes Luxury Handbag Market. Um, the Educated Eye series covers uh, different asset types and categories, discussing, discussing the market in general and ways to buy and sell sensibly. Uh, today, um, I am joined by Kate Milletz, who is our Director of Appraisals and a specialist in luxury items. Um, I am Kerry Lee Jeffrey, and I'm a senior, directory, senior Director of Agency and Advisory here at the Fine Art Group. Um, and just as a, as a little note for those that are new to our firm, um, the Fine Art Group is a large, multifaceted, uh, tangible asset valuation um, company. Um, we handle appraisals for fine art, um, art financing, <laughs> um, agency, which is sales, advisory, which is assisting with acquisitions. And I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kate, to um, bring us through um, the world of Hermes. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, good morning uh, or good afternoon to some. Um, and thank you so much for being here uh, to talk about probably one of my very favorite subjects, which is um, handbags in general, but to talk about Hermes, um, which is something that um, some of you may not know, I'm a horse person, so it's deeply rooted um, for their handbags, which is why um, just to start off, um, something that I get a lot about these bags is, are they really worth it? Um, and why, if so, why? Um, and to really be able to explain that um, thoroughly would probably take days, um, but in an effort to go through that for you here today is to really talk a little bit about the company and where they came from and where they're going um, and you know, kind of the process of how quickly um, they became known for quality. Um, and then also looking at you know, our favorite thing, which are the types of bags and uh, the quality of the bags and the types of skins and what to look for when you're looking at a bag and where to buy and how to buy and, and kind of those key markers you want to look for. Um, and so at the end of this, we hope that all of you are just a little bit more of a specialist uh, than, than before uh, we started. So to go through these, and I'm going to try to go through these pretty quickly because they're handbags and they're fun to look at. So I have lots of slides. Um, but I, as I mentioned, Hermes is deeply rooted in horse um, leather and the use uh, and really use, which goes back to the way it's constructed. So wanting something that's going to last, something that's hand stitched, something that was made, um, you know, originally the very first thing that was um that was created was the horse harness and different leathers for carriages. Um, it wasn't until probably about 50 years later, they started making saddles and bridles. And then they moved on to the first real handbag, which is the piece that you see on the screen, which was really made to be, uh, to take your saddle. It could fit your saddle, it could fit your bridle. And this is a handbag they still make today. So if you want and you have horses and you want to put a saddle in it, uh, you certainly can. Uh, but this is one of the largest bags. It's now considered to be um, a bag that can be used for every day, but really it's more of a travel bag. Um, slide. Um, and to continue, um, one of the, the things that made um, Hermes so successful, and you'll notice throughout this process is that um, as I'm going through that, it's a family run business. It always has been, and it continues to be to this day. So it's passed down from, um, from uh, originally uh, to son and then to um, son-in-law. So we're going to see that. And I gave you a little bit of that information on here, but it wasn't until 1922 that they actually got the patent and the exclusive rights on the zipper, which was an incredibly important um, aspect to them and to the bag. So that's really when their handbags took off um, and that ability really specifically to work within what they knew, which was golf as well. Um, and so it was a luxury market that was taking off that certainly those involved in making the bags um, at Hermes were, were playing. And so they really kind of used that zipper for handbags, for um, clothing. And we really, that's where we started to see the men's ready wear, jewelry, sandals, jackets, golf bags. Um, slide. 
Um, it was in 1937 that we really started to, get to see them start to break into um, maybe I would say the more delicate area of their mess, which would be the scarves. Um, the tie, um, which actually, interestingly, um, actually came into being um, in the south of France when um, men were going from the um, the casinos, they were being turned away because they didn't have ties and they were going into the Hermes store looking for ties so that they could um, buy them and then be led into the casinos. And this was an area then that they saw a real need. Um, and so that's when they started creating the tie uh, that we know today for Hermes. Um, everybody has heard pretty much uh, of the Kelly bag, which actually was designed in the 1930s, um, but it wasn't until 1956 uh, when this bag actually became known as the Kelly bag, because that is a picture of um, Princess Kelly, uh, Grace Kelly of Monaco carrying the bag. That is the bag in the picture there with a pair of her gloves. Um, and that's kind of the first real um, use of, let's say, the press and celebrity uh, notoriety for the Hermes line um, in terms of collecting and creating a buzz around these bags. Um, in the 60s and 70s, and this is when Robert Dumas, which would be the son-in-law, um, really took over and he started out doing, um, he really saw the need to expand, uh, went into the readyware collection for women um, and slide. And that's when we see some of the other areas like shoes, watches, um, that famous H buckle we see on a lot of pieces from handbags, mostly to um, different pieces of jewelry and obviously the belt. Um, 84 is when we really saw the Birkin bag uh, come out. Um, for those who don't know, the Birkin bag actually had, um, actually came from a, a chance encounter um, with Jean-Louis Dumas. Um, who was on a flight with Jane Birkin, and she was complaining about her kind of satchel uh, straw bag and how it would fall over and things would come out of it and how she desperately wanted a bag that would have certain aspects that would keep her things safe. Um, and so they spent the flight designing this bag together um, and really looking at taking some of the things that make Hermes what we know today in terms of the quality and some of the design features um, but then making it really functional um, for somebody like Jane who traveled quite a bit. Um, and this bag actually in the picture is the very original, uh, the, the original Jane Birkin, Birkin bag. Um, and then we move into the 90s where we start seeing silver and crystal um, slide. And then we move into the luxury goods market that we see today. Um, and they've really expanded like many other brands into other areas from furniture to um, plates and home goods. Um, these all have and something that makes them uh, something we'll see across the board. And even though we're focusing on bags today is that these all have a strong secondary market. Um, so a lot of our clients, um, we see these come up at sale and they, some of these actually exceed the cost at retail, um, but if not exceed, then come very close at auction. Um, and that's something as we talk today about the handbags, we're gonna see how much um, that affects the value. Uh, slide. One of the things um, that I, I wanted to mention um, again, and I'm going to be doing this throughout as we talk about the handbags, is Hermes, as much as they've adapted and added all these new areas and all these lines, is that they've also stayed very true to who they are, as um, not only in terms of having family still running the business, um, but also in terms of the quality, but also the design. And everything goes back to this idea of the saddle and the horse and the lines, the clean lines, the um, functionality. Um, in 2004, we saw the corset, which had a very um, saddle style to it, which was um, a Gautier uh, design. Um, in 1999, we saw kind of the canvas side saddle pockets coming out in a lot of the material. And then as early as 2022, so earlier this year, we actually saw riding silks um, as some of the design ideas for um, some of the clothing. And so as we get into the bags, we trying to answer that question as to 
why? Why are they still so valuable? Why do people go to these to these bags? And it comes down to the family running and making sure that the craft is still there and that the quality is still there. Um, and they still manage the entire process, which is mostly still done in France. Uh, the handcrafted, they're all handcrafted by artisans. We'll be seeing later that you can actually, in many of the bags, determine who the artisan is, that they can actually track that down to if something were to happen to that bag and it were to rip or there to be a flaw for some reason, they can actually track that to the artisan if they're still working there and take the bag back to them. Um, exceptional quality and standards um, and limited quantities, which is really key. Um, there are some very well known uh, handbags, leather goods um, that are also incredibly well done, but they may not have the limited quantities available um, that Hermes has, which on average produces about 200,000 bags a year, which may seem like a lot, but comparatively, um, a lot of the other um, bag sellers at this level often produce over a million a year. Um, slide. One of the things we're going to focus on today um, is spotting quality. And for those on the call to be able to look at a bag and really to determine not only what you like, which is incredibly important if you're buying for yourself or if you're buying for somebody else, what they might actually like and want to carry, um, but also these five details that really go into when you're looking at a bag. Um, what will determine if it is authentic, um, but also if it is a quality bag. Um, these are bags that are meant to be used, much like furniture. Um, I say they have their moments. Maybe somebody spilled a coffee in it. Um, maybe somebody put it down, the dog chewed a corner. Um, there are, these are kind of the five check boxes to make sure that when you're purchasing a bag, we've considered all of these um, and how much is going to be spent on the bag. Um, slide. These might be quite small, so I'm happy to share these with anybody, um, but these are looking at labels and stamps that may be on the bag. It's probably the second question, uh, most popular question I get when looking at these handbags um, is not only why are they so valuable, but also how do you tell um, and if you look at these, obviously the, the red X's are going to be um, ones that are inauthentic and the green arrows are authentic. Um, one of the ways that I'm gonna kind of go through these fairly quickly um, will be looking at the quality of the stamp. So if you look at the one with the silver, you wanna make sure um, there's a certain, um, there's a certain font, if you will, that the Hermes font, which you can see in the, in the middle is absolutely not um, authentic. If you look at the one on the left, and if you look at enough of them, you start to recognize that that is not their font. You can also see um, that it's very hard pressed into the leather, into the leather, where the one, the authentic piece, while it's pressed in and it's very clear and cleanly stamped, the one in the middle is incredibly hard pressed, almost like it's going to go through, um, as opposed to the one on the end, which is coming off um, and it's very lightly stamped. Um, and again, looking at the letters, you can see they're not as thick. Um, they're not as um, clearly defined with that thick um, Hermes print that we, we wanna see. Um, the one on the bottom, again, we're looking at um, a couple of things here, but really we're looking at that H. So if you're looking at the one that is authentic, you can see it's hard pressed, it's easy to read. Um, it's exactly where you want to see it next to the opening, um, and this is on the um, on the, the key lock on the uh, underside um, of the leather that goes across the key lock. Um, and the one on the right, the two examples on the right, um, you can see again, it's clearly stamped, clearly visible. Um, the stitching, um, if you notice um, an Hermes stitching, and this is something I'll show in another um, slide as well, but the Hermes stitching is often at a slight angle. Um, and so that's another way to tell if the stitching is perfectly straight. Um, that's another way to tell as well. So between the stitching um, and looking at the finishing as well, the way the edge is banded and finished, um, and also the stamp is very clean, it's very clear, and it's very easy to read. Kate, um, yeah. oh, I was gonna say, I 
you know, looking at some of these stamps side by side, you know, you can see those those differences. I think one of the the, the issues that someone may have is if they're going out to market on their own and they're looking at one Birkin, you know, they're not going to have the ability to necessarily compare them. And obviously this is a market that has huge abundance of mm -hmm. cakes and copies. And so how important is it to buy from a reputable source for Hermes specifically, or, you know, utilize an advisor per se? Um, because there are many websites where you can buy Hermes and Birkins and um, other luxury but not all are um, reputable, not all have experts, um, not all are going to be selling authentic pieces. Sure, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I do have a slide where I do talk a little bit about that, but um, I'm happy to incorporate it here because it's a great time, um, which is these these bags are not inexpensive. Um, this So in terms of they range anywhere from, uh, a few thousand dollars up to five hundred thousand dollars, and when you're spending that, you know, anytime it's just like with art, um, there are going to be replicas out there. And so, number one, if the value is too good to be true, it probably is. Um, it's looking at the who you're buying it from. I mean, do your research. Um, is this somebody that typically you know, regularly deals in these bags, or is this somebody that happens to have a collection? Um, you know, it's something that we want to look at. Do they have a global presence in these handbags? Because one thing that we are going to see is that, um, you know, there's all, for the last five years, there's been an incredibly, almost five to 10 years, there's been an incredibly strong presence um, uh, for buyers in the Asian markets. And so you want an auction house or a reseller that is somebody that has that global presence because that's where a lot of the value comes from and a lot of the buyers come from. Um, it also, you want to make sure there's somebody that has somebody on staff, people who are specialists who know how to look at these bags, um, who know how to read all these marks. To your point, Carrie, um, it can be very difficult. It's like walking in to look at, let's say a Dali print, and you may not know immediately without putting them side by side, even side by side, you may not know. So employing somebody um, like uh, an advisor, like the fine art group, or somebody that actually knows how to um, decipher these um, through all of the things I'm actually going to talk about in terms of the quality um, is also incredibly important. Um, you start to see these over and over again. Um, I can tell from a photo usually, sometimes it takes a little bit more than that if they're a really good fake, um, which, you know, globally they're starting to crack down on, um, but they can be incredibly deceiving. And I, I think I know somebody in every auction house and reseller um, that we work with that has come across one that really stumped them. And so um, it's definitely going through this process and looking at all these details, all the five things that I put down, um, you have to consider all of them and not just one of them. Um, and so we can uh, slide. Um, and to that point, um, what you'll see, and, and I do want to make one, um, one note is that not every bag is stamped. And so that is something that we get often, which will say, well, it's not stamped. It must not be correct. And that's not true. Again, it's why you have to look at all five of those, those um details that I mentioned because they are not all stamped. It depends on the year, it depended on who made it. Um, most are, but there are some that are not and they are authentic. Um, and so it's looking at maybe the other four categories on that list to determine. Um, and for example, um, I get a lot of questions about what these numbers and letters and what they mean. Typically when you're looking at a Birkin, you're going to find them um, stamped um, under that leather, under that lock leather that closes over, you'll find um, the date um, letter there, which I have included the uh, one of the charts for that, which you can get online, you can get it at Hermes, you can get it at a number of different um, secondary resellers. Um, and also you're going to be able to tell, so the information that there is like the craftsman stamps, um, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more um, but it's really looking at the those details of the stars and the letters to determine exactly um, 
who made it um, and the date it was made, the type of material, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. Um, also, you can see I've included on this slide three different areas it could be stamped. Um, one would be on the far left in that taupe color. That's where the bag kind of folds on the side. It can be right there. The one in the middle is obviously on the side where that little flap is that you can turn up. Um, and then, as I've mentioned multiple times, I usually on a Birkin and a Kelly will find it on that piece that, um, that closes over the lock. Uh, slide. I couldn't possibly fit all of them on one slide or even probably about five slides, um, but I did want to discuss a little bit of the details of the types of materials um, because we have, a, there can be a very wide range of value based on the material um, and also what the little, um, the little marks indicate on each of these, which as I mentioned before, they might indicate the type of material, it might, it might indicate who the maker is, so for example, um, on the pink one on the bottom, um, there's a little star um, and um, you can see there's, you can, that follows the craftsman. Um, if you see um, such as the one that's the red one ab above it, um, it was, if you see the kind of shooting star, that's designed for personal use. That's a craftsman who created a bag for their own use. Um, if you look at, the um, the bag on the the far right, which is the gold and yellow bag, you can barely see it, but by the finger underneath is a blind stamp S, and that would be something that was sold at a discounted rate to an employee. Um, you'll often see a horseshoe next to where the bag is stamped, and this again is on, uh, right above the lock, which you can see on some of these, um, where the stamp is, the horseshoe, which would be it's a custom bag made for somebody in particular. Um, and then a lot of these others that are listed on here uh, indicate the type of material, um, the different types of crocodile, the different types of alligator. Um, also, um, is it shiny? Is it matte? Um, these are just some of the things that um, you can find next to, um, next to that stamp. Um, something that does come up that I get um, a question about probably a lot more recently would be about um, the ethical side of these bags and the leather and the materials used in them. And Hermes is very dedicated to making sure that they're following global standards relating to the ethical treatment of animals. And they work very closely with different areas um, throughout the world um, to make sure that they're farming these animals uh, sustainably. 95% um, of the leather that they use is a byproduct of the food industry. 92% um, of the hides that they used are um, sourced in Europe and are by um, are very much in compliance with with rules and regulations um, and 90 percent of the crocodile and alligator skins that they use are coming from certified sites um, meaning they are farmed specifically for or and they're also being used for their meat and other qualities so um, if anybody has any questions about it Hermes has an incredibly detailed um, part of their website where they go through all of the details of how they ethically um, sustain their handbags. Um, slide. Um, again, just continuing on the materials, um, I included some of the different types. These are the most, um, I would say probably the most, uh, you'll, these are the ones you'll see the most often um, from the Togo to the Clements. Um, some of them have replaced older ones. So again, if you're looking at a bag and you're looking at the date, that's a really good indication if the bag was say um, from the date mark on it is from the 1980s, but the leather is Togo, then you need to have a conversation with the person selling it um, or with your advisor about making sure that that is an authentic bag because Togo didn't come in until 1997, but it replaced another type of pebbled calfskin leather. So making sure we have that correct is really important. The same thing with the Swift, which is a more recent 2006. Um, I've had a couple of other bags um, that I've looked at that look like the Swift but are dated earlier, but it was a different type of um, leather that was very similar. Um, we also get a lot of questions regarding alligator versus crocodile. If you looked at the last slide, you now know how to determine what it is. 
Um, you also need to look at things like matte and shiny that also determines value. And ostrich is obviously one of the more, um, uh, one of the favorites that we see quite a bit in all the different colors. Slide. Um, I'm going to spend just a moment on this because um, these are all the different colors. And these are the official colors for all of the handbags um, and the different kinds that you can see. So it's also incredibly important when looking at it, when you're looking at bags with a retailer or at auction um, and you're not sure about authenticity, look at how they describe the bag. Are they using the, um, the right uh, terminology for the color and for the type of material? So that's a really good um, indication. Slide. Um, a little bit just about style and size. Um, we get, uh, there's two different types of the Kelly bag. Um, again, they're both, it's just about preference. Neither is typically more uh, valuable than the other when it comes to the Returné versus the Cellier. Um, but the Returné is, is obviously gonna be the more relaxed and slouchy kind of version. It's a soft silhouette. Um, literally, they will turn the bag, they'll take the Cellier bag and turn it inside out. And that's what that means. Um, it literally means reversed. Um, and so they'll make it softer and more kind of supple. Um, and the cellier is just, um, it literally means saddler in French. And it is a much kind of harder, um, stands up on its own a little easier, um, uh, a bag. And slide. So I have some additional um, photos here of real versus fake. Um, again, to Carrie's point earlier, when you're on your own um, and looking at bags, um, you can always have some of these. Um, you can find them, some of them online. Um, if you're working with an advisor like us, we always, um, we have a, a very large kind of library of, of all the different fakes that are out there, which change fairly regularly. Um, and you can see little details from the rivets at the top corner, um, you can see the one on the left that's not correct. It actually touches the stitching. Um, a, these bags are, wet, are way too well made to have that happen. Um, so the one on the right that's not actually going over the stitching would be the authentic bag. Um, just going through some of the details, looking at the H um, on the uh, zipper at the bottom and making sure that it's perfectly aligned. Um, and that it really is the representative age and it has the rivets in the, in the corners. Um, and then looking at the one on the bottom, um, the stitching, as I mentioned before, making sure that it's, um, you know, looking at the, both of these are, are um, authentic, but looking at making sure that it has that slight slant um, and that there are no inconsistencies in it. That's something, again, given the quality of the bags, they wouldn't have. Um, slide. Um, I had to do one on size matters uh, because very much what you'll see when we get into the values and um, in the next slide is going to be um, people assume that the larger bags have a higher value and that's just, it's not the case. Um, and it's about the woman who's carrying it. Um, and so we're looking, I specifically chose the one on the left because um, I wanted you to see how they fit the woman. Um, and again, it's about what they, what you're comfortable with, what you like, what you're going to carry in it. Um, and so understanding kind of not only the size to the, to the woman that's buying it and women tend to like a slightly smaller bag that's, um, that can be used day to evening. Um, but also I wanted everybody to see the way that these are described. So often you'll see something described as a, Kelly Cellier 25. That goes back to the 25 centimeters, which would be the size. Um, the same thing with the Birkins, you might see it described as a 35 or a 40. Um, and that and that is where that's coming from, which is would be the size. It's also a really good way, and that's measured across the bottom of the bag. Um, that's another really good way when you're looking at a bag to measure it, make sure that it is appropriately labeled and sized uh, based on what you're looking at. Slide. So I'm gonna start with the Birkin, the most expensive bags in the world. Um, we, there are two different types that I'm going, that I'm mentioning here. One, which would be um, the diamond 
Um, we can look at one that actually literally has diamonds in the, uh, the lock, um, which would obviously has the highest value. Um, and the next would be ones that are, that would be a simple lock, which are typically on these Himalayan bags or the white are going to be white gold. Um, the Himalayan bag is by far um, the highest valued of the Hermes bags, both the Birkin and the Kelly. Um, the Kelly actually holds the highest, uh, the highest value ever achieved at 513,000 um, for a private sale in 2022. It is the diamond um, Himalayan. Um, and before everybody gets excited, there is not some mythical Himalayan um, crocodile wandering around you know, the Himalayan uh, mountainside. It is, it just adds to this allure. These are um, hand dyed and painted like many of the other skins. Um, very much um, when you're looking at them is to the coloration is very much about individually what you, what you like. Um, most of the time, um, people are going to go for ones that have more contrast, kind of the darker brown to the white in the middle. Um, the one thing that sets apart the $513,000 bag besides the diamonds um, would also be that it is the Kelly, it's a 28. So it's, again, it's a mid-size. It's not huge, but it's not the smallest. Um, it's also the Gris color. So G-R-I-S which is the most um, sought after of the Himalayans. So it's a little bit more of that gray brown. Um, and so that's certainly something um, that we definitely, we wanna look at when we're looking at the color, why that bag may have sold for 513 over the, um, the pitiful 345 that the other one made. Um, so these are, this is the range that we're seeing in these Himalayan bags. If you go on first dibs or any of the auction sites and their bag sales, these are gonna be at the top of the list. They're usually going to have several of them and they're all gonna be in the six, starting in the six figures, unless there's something wrong with the bag. Um, hey, do they know, is there, is there information on how many are produced every year of this particular type? They are very tight-lipped about that. They don't like to state exactly. The problem being that they also do um, custom versions of these bags. So they don't state how many they make in a year. Um, they will, you know, in the last, I would say, I think um, if you look at that kind of grease, that gray that I was talking about, you know, there've only been five that have sold with the diamonds in the last seven years. So that'll give you a little bit of a context um, where when you're looking at some of the larger, um, when you're looking at some of the larger bags, the, the, the larger Birkins, um, some of those, there are quite a few more that are going to be the palladium um, in terms of the metal, the hardware versus the white gold, they're a little bit more affordable. Um, they create, it's kind of the, if you can say lower end version of the bag, um, you'll certainly have more of those than you will of the, of the gray diamond Himalayan Kelly. Um, but they are fairly tight lipped about how many they create in a year. Um, to give and you a sense. Not very easy to acquire on the primary market. I mean, to for certain these bags you're on a long waiting list it's so for sure. a lot of people the secondary market and acquiring them at, at auction or through a specialist dealer may be your only opportunity to acquire and I think that's why it has such a, a vibrant secondary market um absolutely um and so to give you a sense um the Himalayan 25 Birkin so that's a smaller on the Birkin because the Birkin goes up to a 40 um they retail for approximately $61,500. Um, and right now the Himalayan, the average, um, the average cost for the Himalayan is over, is in the about a hundred thousand to 125,000 without the diamonds. Um, the Himalayan diamond Birkin averages about 250,000. If you bought it directly from Hermes, if you can get on that list and get one, and it's doing about the average right now is about three hundred and fifteen thousand at auction, so it shows it's, what. Yeah, I was going to say it's interesting. It sort of parallels the ultra contemporary market where you have these artists that have such a limited supply offered at the galleries that their works that come up at auction are exceeding 
their primary market uh, prices to some degree. Um, so it's very smart on Hermes's part, but it, it really does keep the value in their in their products. Um, they're not sort of oversupplying and, you know, their bags are going to lose value. Um, they're actually helping their collectors and their buyers by keeping this market strong, keeping it secure to some degree. They very much are. Um, and it's not just in the number, it's not just in the number of how many they're producing, but also kind of in, in the allure that they put out of that number and the, you know, everything from the diamonds to the, the colors to the parts of the um, crocodile that they're using to this kind of idea of the Himalayan crocodile that they've created over the years. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide, um, I did wanna talk a little bit about that market and just looking over the last five years um, that we've really seen overall in terms of all of the Himalayan bags. So the diamonds, the non-diamonds, the Kellys, um, the Birkins, um, we're seeing a 21% increase in the last five years. Um, and you know what the average price used to be about 106,000. Um, now it's about 200,000. Um, again, that, that ranges a little bit when you're looking at say the Kelly, the average for 2022 is about 300,000. Um, and so, and I mentioned earlier that bigger is not always better when it comes to these bags, but when the average is about 21% over the last five years, looking at the Kellys and the smaller Kellys and Birkins, um, you know, the Kelly 28 is a 43% increase in five years. Um, and that's incredibly significant. And I think it's because not only three goods and often on with our firm, we advise a lot of our clients leading up to the holidays with acquisitions for Christmas. Um, and we are looking at these assets and uh, we thought that this webinar would be useful to a lot of uh, new collectors who want to start a collection as well as collectors who have an established handbag collection. Uh, especially as you navigate these sales where some of the values are increasing significantly um, as Kate um, as Kate was demonstrating with some of these results. Um, I think handbags, like every other asset class, um, you know, where you're spending a sort of a significant amount, uh, there should be a level of due diligence that you follow. And um, Certainly it's a passion buy, uh, just like art and some other assets, um, but you can have a little bit of due diligence and some, some sensible choices behind that passion. Um, so I think Kate should be hopping back on. Um, but the slide we're looking at right now is looking at some of the, the strongest results um, recently. Um, and there's Kate. Let's see if audio is back up. Is that any better? Perfect. Yes, we can yeah. hear you now. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to leave my video off. I don't know if it's still on, but hopefully it, it works. Um, so I'm not sure where um, I want to try to move through because I know we lost some time, but um, I was able, hopefully everybody can see the screen. They were able to see some of the other results for some really important bags, um, including this more recent limited edition that's on the bottom left corner. Um, ones that, you know, just 2019, um, and we're seeing a, a price that, you know, purchase price of between 150 and 200,000 is easily reselling for 225 um, from retail to auction. Um, go on to the next slide. These are three of the most um, probably um, common um, bags to see because of the size and the quality um, and just they can go from day to night. They are readily available at um, auctions and um, the resellers that we, all of the resellers that we work with um, looking at auction um, as well as places like the Real Real, um, First Dibs, they're ones that come up regularly. Again, um, even though they come up regularly, it's really important to check off all of those five details I mentioned before. It doesn't just mean for the Birkins or for the Kellys. Um, it's also really important for all of the um, Hermes bags because at the end of the day, they are all um, handmade um, and the quality is there and should be um, and should be checked on every bag you're looking at. Um, next slide. 
Um, as I mentioned before, and I've mentioned throughout the presentation, when you're looking at buying and selling, um, not everybody can get a bag from Hermes. And most of these bags that we've talked about today are special order. And that's even if you can get on a special list. So um, we obviously we want to, these are some of the um, resellers that we look at um, that are really great for buying and selling. Um, you want to look at places that have in-house specialists who really know what they're looking at. A global market presence, which I mentioned earlier, because we want to make sure that some of the areas like in Asia, where we have the strongest buyers for this material right now, that it's somebody who is working in that, um, in that market. Um, making sure they are someone who's an authorized reseller, meaning it's somebody that Hermes um, knows is selling the bags, has stated they um, them to be uh, to be selling authentic bags. And as much, you know, we hear a lot with paintings, we'll often say, you know, authenticity guarantees and those little slips you get don't mean anything. Um, for um, the seller, so if you're buying a bag that is being resold, um, you certainly want to be working with somebody that if the bag turns out not to be correct, that you can take it back to them and um, get your money back. Or if something else comes up with the bag um, that's not based on what it was when you bought it, um, that it's it, that they are reputable and can, can work with you with the bag. Um, also helping you potentially to take it back to Hermes and have it fixed. Um, like I mentioned, we know who the makers are. A, a lot of the bags are stamped and they often will take them back to, to perform work on them, much like a, a piece of art and an artist. Um, uh, next slide. I just wanted to bring up a couple of these as of right now. These are three of kind of the trendiest bags right now for Hermes. Um, they've come out in the last couple of years. Um, they are pieces that are um, certainly gaining momentum. Um, they are all limited edition um, and they are ones that you can buy at directly from Hermes. Some of them are now not available like the two on the left, um, but they are also becoming available on that secondary market, which we just talked about. Um, and so certainly ones like the top one um, with the little waving man. Um, that's something that comes in all different colors and is something that you can um, end in uh, a couple of different sizes. And that's definitely something that we've seen come up at auction since 2019. It's not uncommon to see these come up um, that they were released in the fall, let's say of 2019, and for them to be in a sale in the spring of 2019. Um, and so this is certainly a bag that we've seen. Um, the same thing with the one underneath, um, which came actually in two different versions, this color, this blue, and also a gray. Um, and then the Black Shadow Birkin, um, which is right now one of the most sought after bags um, because it's one of the newer bags to come out um, in different sizes as well. Um, and slide. Um, just to um, finish up, again, I, we could probably talk about these bags and all the details for days. Um, but I wanted just to mention what I did on the very first slides, which is to go back to this idea of the foundation and why Hermes is so incredible at what they do, which is they have some of the bags like we just saw on the last slide, um, which are special edition and very much a statement to contemporary uh, design and art and what they're seeing in the market. Um, but at the end of the day, they also have, and these are all bags from the last year, um, always go back to their foundation, which is um, this idea of incredibly well-made leather um, and this equestrian style design um, that these all walked the runway um, in last year. So um, uh, it's incredibly important to who they are, um, sticking with the tradition of the bag um, and something I think that they will continue to do. And that's why um, even some of their, um, even over some of the bags like we saw in the last slide, which are definitely very interesting and contemporary and fun, um, their classic handbags, the Birkin, the Kelly, um, are going to be the bags that still carry the highest value um, and, and for, for the purpose of the quality. Um, so I hope Everybody learned a little bit of something today, probably um, a lot more questions as well. Um, and we are here to help um, at any point. And, um, and uh, we're going into the holidays. So hopefully everybody can take this and use this for some, some great shopping. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Um, as, as always, like a wealth of knowledge. And I think it's a really important topic to talk about. Um, it's 
wonderfully fun to talk about handbags, but there's so much value here and so much variation that I think it's it was a webinar that was was well needed. And um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, the recording will be available on our website. Um, and we will be um, announcing our next webinar in the upcoming weeks. And if there's any topic you'd actually love us to cover, um, let us know. Um, and um, uh, thank you very much for joining us.